Ready. Wow, okay. It's not daylight savings this week, right? Yeah, okay. <laughs> I didn't ask anyone about. All right, who wants to ring the bell? Fiona. Fiona, would you like to ring the bell? Okay. Hi. Good morning, Fiona. If I give you the bell, there you go. And should I say it, or do you want to say it? Okay. May the sound of the bell remind us that the Spirit of God is within us and among us. Thank you, Fiona. That was lovely. Put that on the little cushion there. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle, for that. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Okay, we gotta start. We gotta. We have to do this again. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. There we go. You're getting there. <laughs> Good morning, and welcome to our worship service here at St. Peter's. Daring justice, exploring homelessness and precarious housing in Sudbury. We will answer on this fifth Sunday of Epiphany. Our call to care for our neighbors and so we're going to find out what is needed what is the reality and what are some of the things that we have been doing and can continue or start doing to help out this morning um, as we begin our service those of you who have not met me yet i think there's maybe one or two um, i am reverend ryan fay i began in service with saint peter's here on july 1st i'm very pleased to be here my pronouns are he him il lui alors tu peux me parler en français aussi you can speak to me in french or english and you can speak to me in any language but those are the two i'll respond in and uh, i would also like to thank uh, michel giroux our new 
director of music for his wonderful improvisation this morning. And uh, Michelle began on January 1st in this position. And uh, we are very pleased you are here. We are very blessed. We have been very blessed here at St. Peter's with music ministry and past as well. And next week we will be celebrating the ministry of music that has been celebrated and shared with St. Peter's for the last 30 years of Judith Holman. And so I hope that we will be here to celebrate that and to wish her very well in her next journey, parts of the journey as a retired person. Today's service, we'll be exploring the theme of homelessness and precarious housing in Sudbury with special guests. One is uh, Mr. Raymond Landry from the, he is the coordinator of housing services for the Sudbury Homeless Network. So thank you very much for being here, Raymond, uh, Mr. Landry. And uh, we will also be visited after this service by two city councillors, Deb McIntosh and Fern Cormier who will share with us details of what is being done with the, by the city to help engage the situations of people living with homelessness and precarious housing. And all are welcome to join in a lunch and learn discussion with them that will begin officially at noon, but if you go down after the service, you'll be able to take part in uh, some yummy food. It smells really good in here. And uh, if you are not going to be staying for lunch and learn, there are refreshments that will be in the fellowship hall, which you can also participate and partake in. And um, also due to illness, there will not be a special separate children's ministry program uh, for, for children under the age of 12. Yeah. The youth program is still going on. Sure. Yeah, Lynn says yes, okay. And, uh, and so uh, after the time for the young at heart, the children are invited to stay. There are activities at the activity center that uh, people of all ages can enjoy. And uh, children are welcome to participate. And then when I say children, I say ch mean children of God. Participate at the activity center or bring an activity back to your seat with your family and uh, share in that during the service. This is a space that welcomes and celebrates the presence of all ages and stages. Our masking practice is that we wear masks unless we're at the mic. We take that off and put it back on when we're done at the microphone. And uh, especially if you're singing, that is a vector, so we encourage that. If you're seated and you're having any issues with breathing and you need to take the mask off for a few minutes to catch your breath, that's okay. And in the order of worship, you will notice the printed bulletins. If you're following with the printed bulletins, the bold print is for unison or responsive participation in the service on screen it's going to be white white <laughs> white print uh, for uh, anything responsive or unison and uh, all of the hymns are unison so please do sing along no matter what color you see on the screen for the print as we move more deeply into worship i invite you to join with me in our territorial acknowledgement the announcements will be right after this, actually. Yeah. I know, it feels like I've been doing announcements. Sorry about that. <laughs> we acknowledge that the lands that our churches and many of our homes sit on have been stewarded by the first peoples of Turtle Island, among them the traditional territory of the Atikmasheng Anishinaabe peoples. We commit ourselves as a faith community to the multi generational work of reconciliation the pursuit of true justice and flourishing well-being for all peoples who now call Canada home. And as we come to a time of the life and work of the congregation, um, I do want to make sure I got all those. Those are done. Okay. So um, next week, as I mentioned, we will have the celebration of ministry for Judith Hallman. After 30 years of sharing and ministry with St. Peter's, we will celebrate that. We'll also be lifting up Have a Heart Day, which is a day in which we are called to send cards, valentines, um, letters to the uh, government of Canada to lift up the need for the dignity and respect and, and, and rights of, in particular, Indigenous children, but uh, Indigenous peoples in general, and as a treaty people to remind one another of our responsibilities and to call for that in love. So we're going to lift that up and uh, there'll be different activities related to that as well. There are, is a call for other announcements. I have one, two, I know three or four at least, so let's get, I'll let that go on. Hello, 
Amy Holmengroat, daughter of Doug Holman, who miraculously has taken a Sunday off this week. So he has tasked me to remind you yet again of the celebration next week. Um, there is still time to um, fill an envelope at the back for donations for the uh, reception and the gift uh, for Judy. And you can put your comments in there, I'm told, as well, or by par. Um, with the instructions on on the rock um it's going to be full of great music all of judy's favorite music so it'll be a great service to be at and um there will be cake hello julian shell coldest night of the year is coming up and i'm very encouraged the number of walkers who are fundraising is slowly rising. The donations are coming in, and we're close to our target, but we're going to far exceed it anyway. I know that. So, um, uh, and of course, there will at St. Peter's there will be a party. So, the twenty Friday, the twenty fourth. Um, the walkers will be leaving at six o'clock to do their walk and we will be gathering in the parking lot to cheer them on and there will be skating with Reverend Ryan, there will be games in the parking lot and um, lots of yummy food, uh, snacks, hot chocolate, so please put Friday, February 24th, which is the day before the city walk, but you know, we're doing it a bit differently because we had so much fun last year. Put that date in your uh, agendas and plan to come and walk if you can, to donate if you can, and all of you can come and party. So hope to see you then. Good morning, I'm Charles, your Congregational Coordinator. And on behalf of uh, the Affirm Committee, you might have seen a, a sign note in the narthex asking for donations. We're going to be, after a hiatus due to COVID, we're going to be once again celebrating Pi Sunday. And Pi stands for Public Intentional Explicit and refers to our public intentional and explicit commitment to the inclusion of the LGBTQ2S1A plus people of St. Peter's. It is standards that we hold ourselves and are welcome to when we seek to live affirming and inclusive. We will be celebrating Pi Day this year on March 12th and during the service and after the service by eating. We are requesting uh, your assistance. There will be fellowship after, but we're asking if there's anybody who's able to, to make a few pies. Uh, if you can, you can sign up on the, in the narthex. There's a sign-up sheet. If you're not able to bring them in yourselves, one of the team members from a firm will pick them up from you. We're looking at about having six or seven pies to cover the, hopefully, the number of people that will be participating after the worship service. Thank you. My name is David Keckney, and I retired as chair of property on April the 1st of last year after eight years and five months of service. In late January, I was invited to return to the being chair of, as of August, August, February 1st. This announcement is about heat, not about saving money. It's about your warmth and your comfort. Axiom one, air moves from cold air to warm air. Axiom two, to heat an office, sanctuary, hall, or bedroom to your comfort level, the door must be closed. I know that Reverend Ryan, Charles, Michelle want a warm welcome by opening wide the sanctuary doors but property wants you, who come early, to be warm, comfortable, quietly probably chanting with your friends, possibly meditating on the imminent service. Property requests that until weather warms up, only one sanctuary door be opened before service, 
and closed when it starts. The folding door on the fellowship hall here may be left open because the hall is heated to 22 degrees. The base temperature of the church is 16 degrees, and this is where I come to the important part with the narthex offices and kitchen at 18 degrees overnight and when the spaces aren't being used. Using our five Y5 thermostats, and two of them are here, the temperature is raised as needed, 22 degrees centigrade, and if you want Fahrenheit, it's 72. Um, in the fellowship hall and uh, sanctuary. Heritage Hall is raised to 20 for scouts, guides, etc. Today I raised it to 22 degrees so you'd be comfortable down there. UCW and others should take particular note. Kitchen heat is controlled by the Narthex and the Narthex thermostat. It's uh, like your bedroom is cold and you wonder why until you realize that your thermostat's down in the living room. Narthex offices and kitchen, in fact the whole addition wing is 22 degrees on Sunday morning. That is a reasonable and attainable temperature with the main entrance doors being opened and closed. Also when you enter the sanctuary, coming from the 20 to the 22, you'll feel warmer and, and uh, comfortable. Now if you are the minister, CCC, music director, committee chair, and everybody else, and you wish to um, use the space, please note that the temperature, if you don't tell us, will be 16 degrees. The office manager will raise the temperature when you request that, that room or hall. Give her the day, the time in, and the time out and uh, uh, of your meeting. Uh, so I thank you for that. And here someone's added a postscript. If you are cold in the sanctuary at 22 degrees, think about what you are wearing. Bare arms and open neck may be the culprit. You may be cold, but the rest of us, most of us, will be enjoy the inviting warmth and comfort of the heat. Thank you, David. And I think you all should thank David because if, uh, if to me, 16 sounds perfect. So it's, thank you, David, for that. And uh, I want to thank everyone for their announcements and lifting up the very active and vibrant life of St. Peter's in the relationships, partnerships, and work that we share in in this community. So thank you all for that. This month is Black History Month. And in spirit of solidarity and marking this important month to remember, I'll be lifting up each Sunday a different person from Canadian history who has had an impact on our society. These people are black and have done amazing work in the face of great resistance and social oppression and judgment and yet have persisted on. Today's person to mark is Mary Ann Shad Carey, who lived from 1823 till 1893. She was an activist, an educator, a publisher, and a journalist. She was the first black woman to publish a newspaper in North America called The Provincial Freeman. As an educator, Shad Carey established a racially integrated school for black children in Windsor, Ontario, and as an activist, she advocated for the rights of black people and women. With gratitude, we lift her spirit of courage and her work for justice and education. Thanks be to God. Like many in this world, Shai Carey carried a light of love and justice, one that we are called to by the message of Christ to share with one another and with the world. And wrapped in symbols of inclusion and justice, we light this candle as a reminder that our light shines all the brighter when it is shone out together. Embodied in flame, 
lived out in the world. I invite you to join me in our spiritual focus. We gather as grateful people seeking Christ's word made new for this time and this place. We gather together to do all we can to live the Creator's intention of community of right relations, of community of peace. We gather together ready to act as the Spirit guides us with our seeking, our living, our acting. We worship God. I invite Don Harry to lead us in our prayer of the day. Please join in for the prayer of the day. Transforming God, whose word nudges us to acknowledge hungry people on street corners and give of our abundance to food banks, help us go beyond the ease of passing by. Enable us to work toward the day when food banks can close and homeless adults and children will have enough to eat and places to live in peace and safety. And we can experience the justice and peace you wish for us. May it be so. Amen. Our opening hymn comes from More Voices, the Coilbound hymn book. Number one, let us build a house. And the words will also be on screen. Let us sing.
This is interesting with a puppet with one hand, but I'll, I'll do it. There we go. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Stevie. Stevie says good morning, too. Yeah. How are we today? It's been kind of warm. Hmm? warm. You're warm? Yeah, me too. <laughs> Everybody warm enough? Yep. Okay, excellent. So S Stevie was, was kind of cold this week. Was anybody else cold a bit this week? Yeah. 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 See some hands going up. Yeah. Stevie stayed in his burrow like three days. It was very chilly, he said. Yeah. And then when it was time to come to church this morning, Stevie had some trouble. Because it had snowed and it had frozen, and he was stuck. And he tried to get out by himself. He says he's strong. He can do it, right? Yeah? Did you do it? No, he didn't. Not by himself. So what happened was that Stevie called his friends. Stevie called his family. They're quite large family. He's a rabbit, after all. <laughs> and, and they called some friends from outside of the, in another burrow, and they dug out together. And they got out. And that's why Stevie's at church this morning. Isn't that great, Stevie? He likes it. He likes coming to church. And so what Stevie learned this morning was that sometimes a job is, even if you're strong, even if you're capable, a job is bigger than it takes one person or one rabbit to do. And so I wanted to give an example. It's going to be harder with my, with my arm, but I think we can do this. Stevie wants to touch that door over there, but doesn't want to leave the chancel. And so we've got, I'm going to ask some people who are seated over here to help me out. Can you, you want to help? You guys want to help? If you can, don't do anything that's going to hurt you. I'm going to move around a bit. But Stevie wants to hold hands with someone, and then, so technically I'm on the chancel, so Stevie doesn't laugh. But then, if you hold someone's hand back there, and you hold someone's hand behind you, and you hold hands with people behind you, and if someone behind you, you might have to shift around a little, but is there someone that would hold hands there? And if you hold hands with someone behind you, and if someone holds hands behind you, there you go. If you're comfortable, don't have hands if you're not comfortable. And look, Lynn's touching the door. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. So Stevie got to touch the door without leaving the chancel, technically. And the reason Stevie came up with that activity just now, not to leave everyone on this side of the church building out, but was <laughs> just to demonstrate that together we can accomplish as a, as a community, as a society, as a people, what one person, even if they're capable, couldn't accomplish. And that when we get to do that, there's laughter, there's sharing, there's reaching out, and there's togetherness. And so thank you, Stevie, for that. And the reason Stevie brought this up is that today's reading really inspired him about the good stuff that we can do that God calls us to look out for one another and to reach out to one another in love and in help. And uh, it really worked out. So thank you, Stevie. And thank you, everyone, for helping out. Let us, let's take a quick moment of prayer. God of love and community, of care and compassion, we thank you for the contribution that children make to this community. We thank you for their voice and their presence, of their joy and their glee, of their struggles and their growth. And we thank you for our opportunity to support them and to live ex as examples of your love, which will inspire love in return. We thank you for the opportunity to help and the gift of togetherness and community. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for, for sharing today.
as we approach the reading of the word, let us lift up verse 1 from More Voices, which is the coil-bound hymn book, from 154, Deep in Our Hearts. Let us sing. Oh, we can stay seated for this one. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Please join me in the scripture reading this morning as indicated on the screen and in your brochure. Is not this the fast that I choose to loose the bonds of injustice, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house when you see the naked to cover them and not to hide yourself from your own kin? Then your light shall break forth like the dawn and your healing shall spring up quickly. Your vindicator shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry for help, and he will say, Here I am. If you remove the yoke from among you, the pointing of the finger, the speaking of evil, if you offer your food to the hungry and satisfy the needs of the afflicted, then your light shall rise in the darkness and your gloom be like the noonday. Herein lies the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You get to hear from me only a little bit today in this, in this time. I will be shortly inviting to the pulpit Mr. Raymond Landry or Landry, pardon me, from the, uh, from the Sudbury Homelessness Network. And uh, I wanted to contextualize a little bit our reading from, the pas from, uh, from this passage of Isaiah. We hear the prophet addressing the people about living authentically into their faith. In the historical context of this passage, the wealthy who lived in Jerusalem were exploiting the poor, in particular poor subsistence farmers, for their own financial betterment and ignoring at the time their commandment to care for the vulnerable within their society. At the same time, they were participating in ornate and lavish religious festivals and made grand public gestures of fasting in order to show how pious they were. Isaiah is calling them and all of us to an authentic expression of compassionate, just, and loving community. And the good news in this message is that reconciliation with God and with one another is always possible. You've turned away from the path, Isaiah says. Guess what? You can turn back. And so those in need are supported and shown divine love in their neighbors when we act to care for others. While those who are blessed with the ability to help get the added blessing of being the hands and feet of Christ. 
much as the call was for the ancient Israelites to turn back to God by turning back to care and justice for one another, we are reminded that we can always choose to care for our neighbors. One way that we can live our faith authentically is to support the needs of those disadvantaged in our society. And today we have the choice, and we have chosen to engage with the needs of those experiencing homelessness and precarious housing in Sudbury. We have invited two city councillors to speak with us after the service, and I hope that all who are able will stay and hear more about what Sudbury is doing and what we can do to help. And now I would like to introduce Mr. Raymond Landry from the Sudbury Homelessness Network to share with us the reality of people living in Sudbury and what is needed and perhaps some things that we can do to help out. So we are thankful for you here, Mr. Landry, and I invite you to the pulpit. <clears throat> Thank you, Reverend Faye and Jillian for reaching out for the invitation. I'll uh, ask you to bear with me. This is my first public exposure of my new face since being struck with Bell's palsy just 10 days ago. So um, I'm feeling it today, uh, but I'm glad I'm in front of a, such a welcoming um, audience. So yes, uh, Raymond Audry, I am an employee of Le Centre de Santé Communautaire du Grand Sudbury, the Francophone Health Center at 19 Fruit Road, although my office uh, is at 307 Cedar Street, the corner of Brady and Cedar. Some of you might know it as the uh, as Foyer Notre Dame for youth before. So we operate out of a big house there and there's a team of us there that are part, one small part of the homelessness network. Um, I'm in my 37th year of uh, working in social services and for the past six years I joined the team at Centre de Santé as the coordinator of the homelessness network. The homelessness network is not an agency on its own. In fact, it's a partnership agreement between six community-based agencies that has existed over the past 16 years. We are contracted by the city of Greater Sudbury to offer direct services to those experiencing chronic homelessness. And in Canada, we define chronic homelessness as persons experiencing six months or more of being homeless or having a long history of not being able to retain an apartment or a house. So we have a very specific mandate and we have several, we have four different pillars under the umbrella of the Homelessness Network that we do to assist the community. Our core service is one of having a team of housing-based case managers to help work with those who are homeless, chronically homeless, and to help them prepare for housing find housing, and then help them maintain that housing over time through to stability. And there are different definitions of those. We also have a street outreach team. Some of you might know them as the Redcoats, going around in a white van through the downtown core and other areas of town. Uh, they are l'Association des Jeunes de la Rue, is their agency. And they used to work under Foyer Notre Dame, but they have become part of the homelessness network over the years. There used to be two individuals doing that work from Monday to Friday, eight to, eight to four, uh, before the pandemic. Once the pandemic hit, the city um, was wise enough to support us in our re request to grow that team because they were one of the only points of contact of physical presence in the community while everything else was closed. And so we grew our community outreach team to nine persons and we now operate seven days a week, 16 hours a day out on the streets, as well as offering services at our door at 307 Cedar Street in the back laneway there. Their job is to provide warm clothing, boots, mitts, hats, occasional snacks and water, and to make sure they're responding to those on the streets and in encampments through the city with what they need to survive from day to day to day. We are only one of the several partners in the city that offer those things. 
There are several outreach teams out there, but they all have a slightly different mandate. Ours is to connect with, serve those on the streets or in encampments, and make sure they have what they need, and also to make sure that they are informed of and connected to the various services that are out there for them, such as housing supports, housing services, financial services, and anything they might need to be able to move forward in, in their goals. The other part is we have a landlord engagement worker. So it's impossible to help people find housing if we don't know the landlords and property owners in the city. And although we make use of public housing almost 80% of the time when finding housing for persons, we do still need the participation and the collaboration of private market landlords. And so we are landlord engagement worker works diligently to find out who has apartments, where they are, and to negotiate our way into the possibility of housing persons within those properties. And the fourth pillar of our work is a preventative one. Of course, we, we want to uh, go up ahead on the stream and prevent other persons and more persons from becoming homeless. So we have a housing support program, which is what some of you might know historically as what the Red Cross used to do. We have rent arrears and last month's rent supports for persons who are on low income, but not on Ontario Works or ODSP, to um, help them through a rough spot by providing some rental supports if they financially qualify for it. We also have, we are also the ones who assist the public with applications to credits on people's utilities, gas bills, electricity, to make life a little more affordable. And if persons, persons can apply for those credits on a yearly basis, if costs of electricity or natural gas become unbearable for them and may cause them to put their housing at risk. So those are the four pillars under the homelessness network uh, that we assist people directly with. Again, as I said, the Homelessness Network is a partnership that's existed now for over 16 years. Those include the Elizabeth Fry Society, the John Howard Society, Swakamak Friendship Center, SASI, the Subway Action Center for Youth, Centre de Santé Communautaire as the lead agency with the city, and Association des Jeunes de la Rue, our street outreach team. Each of these agencies have persons staffed and, and uh, funded to work towards uh, the mandate of the homelessness network. Most agencies have at least two workers in them to provide housing support and housing services or intake and evaluations that people can be set up for housing supports through the city. The scope of homelessness in the city. There'll be arguments about this depending on who you ask. But the city has become a very data-driven, um, informed uh, entity. And we are one of the main participants in creating that. We have now have what we call coordinated access in the city of Greater Subray. For the past two years, multiple agencies have worked together to identify how to best get to know who is homeless and how many are homeless in the city. And to that point, Many agencies have worked together to contribute their daily data to the city to know how many people are sleeping in shelters, which shelters are occupied, which ones aren't, how many people are actually in encampments in the city. And we go out every day, we touch base with everybody we can, and we try and get to know exactly what their needs are. And to that point, part of the coordinated access uh, process is a by name list literally knowing every homeless person by name. That's our goal. And only in knowing that we could touch base with those person, at least ask them what they need, can we think to be able to respond to what those needs are and what their will is. And so this past week, every Wednesday, we get a, a new report because the, all of the service providers, the various service providers, the Homeless Network being one of those, only one of those, provide that information to the city of Greater Sudbury. And there were slightly over 170 persons identifying as homeless this past week in Sudbury. Those are persons who are sleeping outdoors, 
or in encampments or using our various, our, one of our five emergency shelters or uh, living in other people's homes uh, through the, their generosity and openness of sharing some of their spaces without paying rent. The service sector, as I said, is uh, larger than just the homelessness network. Uh, I've brought some, one of our, one of the hottest things in sliced bread, our streetwise guide that we publish as the homeless network on behalf of the city. I've left several copies with Jillian, if you're interested in one of those. It was conceived as if someone was just arriving in the subway and knew nothing about the city. And if you'd handed them that book, they'd have direct access to information and names of the agencies that they might find from, from the sidewalk. So uh, direct door uh, assistance uh, in all spheres of life, from dental to financial to housing to shelters. Uh, and if uh, persons are interested in those, I'm happy to bring more to the congregation if you each want one of those. But we do have a website, homelessnessnetwork.ca, where those publications are on offer there, as well as explanations of who we are. But we go from the off-the-street shelter at 200 Larch, the old police station that the Canadian Mental Health Association operates on a daily basis, 365 days a year, has 35 spaces. Cedar Place for Women through the Salvation Army has some 20 spaces for women and families. Um, the new Safe Harbor House by Elizabeth Fry Society has nine to 10 spaces for women specifically. Sassy has a youth shelter with a few beds and several seating spaces. And during the winter from November 1st to March 31st, there's additional services provided through, again, the Homelessness Network, contracted with another partner agency. This year, the Samaritan Center hosts persons when an extreme cold weather alert is called. So after 11.30 a.m. today, as I look at Environment Canada's website, we will be calling an extreme cold weather alert because it'll be more than minus 15 tonight. In fact, it'll be closer to minus 22. Uh, that will prompt the Samaritan Centre to put on a team of overnight workers and open their doors from 8 p.m. to 8 a.m. to accommodate those who are outside and have no access to other shelter. It's considered a warming space, not a shelter per se. Although they only have 15 physical spaces to accommodate persons, they found a way of opening up their hallways also and are averaging upwards of 40 to 45 persons a night when an extreme cold weather alert is called. It also activates my team, the outreach team. We have an additional team that goes out from, eight, uh, from 10 p.m. to 8 a.m. in our van to roam the streets and connect with anybody who is still outside after hours at that late night and to offer them rides to warm or safe spaces or to offer them on the spot what they might need to assure um, their survival overnight. So the calling an extreme cold weather alert when it's minus 15 or less, or minus 20 with the wind chill or less, activates these additional services that are out there overnight other than the standard uh, service uh, that are there already. And I leave many more out. I've calculated by my own count that on any given day in Sudbury, there are between 50 to 70 professionals, paid professionals, not counting all the volunteers out there that are directly serving the homeless in the community. When you count all the shelters, the housing support services, the city's navigators and housing supports, 50 to 70 professionals, depending on how loaded a shift is with those professionals, trying to assist those who are homeless. The scope of housing. I don't want to steal uh, city councilors thunder, uh, they might be able to speak to the precise numbers uh, better than I will uh, later during your lunchtime. Um, but the context is there's about 5,200 public housing spaces in the city. That being said, presently there are approximately 800 to 900 persons waiting for those spaces. And for a single individual with no other concerns, it could be a four to five year wait to have access to an affordable public housing rent geared to income space in the city. So we do not have enough housing. It's plain and simple. 
when it comes to private market rents, we consider that there is zero housing in Sudbury when it comes to private market rents. You can read the details from Can Canadian Mortgage and Housing, say there's a 2.1% vacancy rate right now. It was 1.6 last year. For us, that means zero. Zero affordability, zero housing for those who are poor. Let me put that in context. A person on Ontario Works still in Ontario in 2023 received $730 a month. The average monthly rent for a one bedroom in Sudbury this year is $1,033. $500 more than a person could even think of paying rent in a one bedroom secured housing. A person on Ontario Disability Supports may get between $900 to $1,200 depending on their specific needs and additional monies they get for those specific needs. They get five, $525 towards their housing, the rest they're supposed to live on with their specific needs. Again, it has been five years since I have seen any rents in Sudbury that come close to the $500 mark. So basically, for those who are living in poverty, not very low incomes, housing is absolutely unaffordable in Sudbury, and the access to that housing is almost nil. So a very treacherous situation. We are in a housing crisis. We hear it on the news every day. We are in several crises. The opioid crisis in Sudbury, um, it's not something you want to be at the top of a list of in Canada, but Sudbury has been for the past few years, unfortunately. There is a serious opioid crisis that's taken many, many lives, many, many young lives uh, in the past few years. So, societal challenges, poverty and income levels, something has to change there. And even once we assist, one of one parts of our program is that we do have rent subsidies and rent housing allowances attached to the ones that we support. It's very limited, but it allows us to gain access to some private market rents with those landlords who are willing to work with us. We can top up somebody's Ontario Works or ODSP uh, uh, rent allowance by $600 and $500. So it gets us to the door of many of those low-end apartments at least. But then the person has to work their way in there by themselves because we do not place people in housing. We assist people to find their own housing. They are faced with judgment, stereotyping, stigmatization. the need for additional health supports, substance use treatments, and specialized supportive housing. Those are the many, many challenges that are the realities of those who are experiencing homelessness in the city, indeed across Canada. And it's tough to take when you know that homelessness is a result of societal and systemic barriers, not individual barriers. So it's up to us as a society to build the structure by which everyone is supported and well supported. For individual challenges, of course, there are many, but no one, there's no one paintbrush and no one color scheme by which we can paint persons experiencing homelessness. We need to think of equity versus equality. And yes, equity where it can exist Equality where it could exist, but fighting for equity in all conditions would level the playing field for most. Until we resolve the housing crisis, as one of my good acquaintances, Ian de Jong, you might have heard his name in the recent past, as he helped the city out with this encampment process a couple of years ago. He's the uh, organizer leader of Org Code Inc., one of the known experts in housing and homelessness. And he says, quite simply, the solution to homelessness is housing. If you take out all other judgments and considerations, or, oh, that person's an addict, they should go get treated before they get housing. They need to go get mental health treatment before they're allowed to be housed. We quash that. We see housing as human right 
And we know through the research of the past 30 years that persons who are suffering from addictions, persons who are suffering from mental illness, persons who are otherwise disengaged from society do much better once they have a place to live. Where do you keep your medication if you have no pharmacy or medical, medical cabinet to keep your medication in? Well, you drop it out of your pocket, in your tent, or in the bush, or you get it stolen from you every day. Housing is at the base of wellness, and our housing crisis is the one thing that needs to be resolved. And to that end, we need to not lose the forest for the trees. We keep looking at the trees individually as the things that are sick and blame them for being so and for ruining the look of the overall forest. And yet, rarely or even ever do we think of looking at the forest itself as the ground in which those trees must grow or indeed survive or as the environment by which they die. Is the ground fertile enough, biodiverse enough to accommodate a variety of plants, shrubs, trees, and other life forms? Are we creating environments that support and allow for healing and recovery, for new growth and even for flourishing? Indeed, it is not one or the other. It is not an all or nothing proposition. And although it is true that trees are the ones who are challenged to grow and must find a way to survive, it is clear that the health of the overall ecosystem, the forest itself, must be accommodating, must be the source of nourishment, water, fertile enough to support and sustain that growth, that healing, for trees to have a hope of thriving. Homelessness is a complex, multifactorial reality that demands societal, economic, political, and systemic changes. No simple, singular effort or program or solution will do. Indeed, more than what any one individual can take on or change. Yet, it demands from us as individuals our attention, our effort, our care and concern, our action. And to that, I call you to mobilize. <laughs> I'm, I was already struck by uh, the generous pr propositions and proposals of this, this morning's um, liturgy. Um, we can gather resources as an individual, donations, give to your existing organized um, organizations of food, of monies, and of specific uh, clothing requests and demands. You can advocate with your municipal councillors with our new mayor, with our MPPs and MPs, to put forth and continue to move quicker on the efforts and financing of developing new housing in Canada. Only that will bring us closer to mitigating the enormous and, in fact, deadly effects of ho homelessness in the city. I took this job six years ago knowing the kind of program that it offered, that it allowed persons to participate, to be a volunteer in the program, not to be forced in taking on services. That was one of the primary aspects of this job, of this program that is the Homelessness Network, which is running under a housing first model. Persons are volunteers. In fact, we, call, we don't call them clients. We call them participants in our program. It is completely up to them to be part of our supports and the way we offer to support them. They only need to be willing to pay rent and to have us visit them a minimum of once a week in their apartments to make sure they have what they need and so that we can help them along with those needs. We've seen good things. The city's endeavors of late have been very, very useful, fruitful, and helpful. The Homelessness Network has housed over 500 individuals in the past six years. Since the city's effort at coordinated access in the last couple of years, over 200 other individuals have been housed. 
But like the hourglass has that thin spot in it um, where things can get blocked and, and start slowing down, we've reached that point now where we've housed all those we can in the housing that is available. And now we're striving to, as a drop, one drop at a time, we still manage to house persons, but it's just a much slower process just because of the sheer lack of access and resources. So I leave you with that. There is hope. I continue to have hope in this job. I continue to see and support my team as coordinator at having success in housing individuals on, on a monthly basis. And with your support and the community as a whole, um, I think we can have, I don't think, I know we are having a positive impact on many people's lives. My only hope is that we have a positive impact on more individuals in need and impacting their lives in a good and healthy way. Thank you for your time and for this opportunity. Canada Helps, available.
each week we lift our prayers of joy and concern with the understanding that the joys are brightened as they are shared together in community and with the divine, and that the burdens that we carry are lightened as the weight is shared amongst community, carried together. Let us pray. God of justice and righteousness, thank you for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, who came to live out your love in this world. Thank you for his words and deeds which continue to challenge and guide us today. He called us to be light for the world and salt for the earth. We thank you for the ministries undertaken throughout the world in our mission and service with the United Church and our many partners, both here and abroad for the light they bring to lives under so many different pressures and the necessities they provide to sustain communities and make hope tangible. And so we pray for your world with all its wonders and its worries, which rest on our hearts and yours. We pray for those who need your justice, loving God, for those who sleep on the cold streets, for those who do not have enough to eat, for those who worry about how to make ends meet for their families. We lift our care and our concern in silence. We pray for all those facing violence in their homes or communities, for nations engulfed in conflict, and for places struggling to recover after flooding, drought, storm, or unrest. And we lift our care and hopes in our hearts. We pray for refugees and political prisoners, for children who must work instead of going to school, and for parents who long to give their children a better life. God of love, sustain each of these people with your hope that their needs can be fulfilled and rights restored. Empower us to use our resources to do what we can for them and give strength and courage to advocates and aid workers who bring hope, who bring hope to birth in many places. We pray for all who need your healing touch, for people who are confused or afraid, for those in hospitals and nursing homes and those who care for them, for all who are dealing with long-term disability or mental illness, long COVID and many illnesses circulating this winter, and for those who have encountered loss through the death of a beloved, change in circumstance or disappointed hopes, and we lift our love and concern for them in our hearts. Surround, loving God, each one with your peace and comfort so that hope for healing will be renewed each day. Compassionate God, make us salt and light for the world, not by presuming we know best how to fix others, but as compassionate and caring neighbors, unafraid to reach out. Encourage us with your grace and inspire us by your Holy Spirit for you are always with us. We gather all our prayers into one voice, praying the words that Jesus taught us in a new form with the Jesus prayer for today, saying, O source of life, connectedness beyond simple perception, we hold our experience of you as sacred. May we choose to live the good you call for, 
in our actions as well as in our imaginings. Nourish our bodies and spirits, inspiring us to share the abundance that we have. Challenge us to show understanding and love for others as we need to be understood and loved. Help us to overcome our shortcomings, to be our best selves through the faith that you have always shown in us. May we all make it so. Amen. Our commissioning hymn comes from Voices United, number 592. Come now, you blessed. Let us sing. As we go from this time together, you're called to break forth in the world, secure in the love of God, break forth into the kingdom of love, of neighbor and service of stranger. Trust the good news, proclaim the good news, be the good news. Amen. Thank you.